Hey, church, it is a joy to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, I understand that as a church, you've been going through the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus' famous sermon there in Matthew. So with your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 6. As you turn there, I'd love to take just a personal moment if you'd allow me. Um, I said it's a privilege to be here, and it, it really is. You know, I remember when I came to the University of Akron and Um, My freshman year, I was invited by uh, an RA and a friend to uh, come to the chapel. And at the time, there was a Sunday evening service, and I remember sitting right up there because down here felt a little bit too close. So I sat up there, and uh, I remember listening to the Bible being taught from this pulpit in ways um, that I had never heard before and uh, came to appreciate the legacy of the chapel of Christ-centered worship and, and biblically founded teaching And it had an impact in my life, right? It changed the way I lived. And um, it was also this church that called me into ministry. It was this church who helped put me through seminary. It was this church where I got married with my wife. It was this church that uh, prayed with the vision to plant churches. It was this church that uh, helped send me out uh, to be the church planter at Medina. You know, we planted with 50 people And the Lord has grown us in two years to over 200 people worshiping in Medina. And and that's largely due to your faithfulness and your sacrifice and your prayers. And I'm so grateful for that. It's so much fun being able to do what we do. And um, I just, so when I say it's a privilege to be here, um, it really is. I I never thought I'd have the privilege to repay the favor that I received um, long ago. Uh, But now, uh, as we turn to the Word, Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be in verse 19. Verse 19, we're actually going to finish the chapter, so uh, let me read the first half. Uh, Let's read the whole thing, and then we'll study it. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures. Oh, you know what? I'm going to get in trouble when I go home, because I didn't introduce uh, my wife. My wife is here, (laughs) Samantha, and that's my family. See, Isaac, after 10 years, you're still learning. Don't worry. (laughs) To the Word of God. All right. (laughs) Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. And I would say memorize this. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is bad, your whole body, uh, I'm sorry, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. If then that light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor um, about your body, what you will put on. He is not life more than food and body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into bonds, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into an oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith. Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. Jesus is teaching there on the mount his famous sermon. He's come to a portion now after just teaching about the Lord's Prayer, how we can seek the Lord for His provision and needs where we seek Him in prayer. 
And now he wants to talk a little bit about money. Which is probably why my friend Pastor Tim has me preach today. <laughs> but he has a word for us about money. Look there in verse 24. No one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one or love the other. He will be devoted to one or despise the other. You can only have one God in your life. He says you cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. They're rival gods looking for your devotion looking for how you prioritize your time, looking for which one will influence you the most in the decisions that you make in life. You have the money God, and you have the Lord God. And in the way you choose, in the way you live your life, the way you prioritize, the way you use your money, will show you which of these two are your masters. And Jesus, because he loves you, he loves his followers, wants to encourage you to forsake the God of money and to embrace the God of heaven. He says, for where your treasure is, worth memorizing, there your heart will be also. He's going to give a couple of reasons why we as a people are often tempted to make money our God instead of the Lord God. First, he's going to use a metaphor here in verse 22. He's going to say the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. He's just saying if you can see well, you're going to be able to see the light. If you have trouble seeing or if you're blind, right, then you don't see light, it's dark. And what's he trying to say there? Well, he's using it as a spiritual metaphor What you take in through your eyes was often a way of of talking about coveting. Coveting, wanting something that God has not given to you. That could be stuff, houses, cars. That could be jobs, statuses. That could be spouses, particular families, neighborhoods you live in. That could be a whole slew of things that you don't have, that God hasn't given you yet, but you see it and you want it. You say, if you, use your, if you see things and you see them as properly, like God wants you to see it as somebody else's, you thank them, you praise God that they have those gifts, that you've given them those wealth, and thank you, God, for the way you provide for me, you will be healthy. But if you've been coveting, you begin wanting things you think you deserve that you don't have, a darkness will come within you. So he says, so often we make God, money our God Because we want things, God hasn't given it to us yet, but man, we know how to take control and get it for ourselves, don't we? We want to live in a certain neighborhood. We want our kids to go to a certain school. We want to wear certain clothes, particular tie. Where is he? (laughs) We, we 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 want these things. God hasn't given them to you yet, but if I have enough money, then I'll be happy. Then people will think well of me. See, there's always deeper desires that influences that coveting. Then I'll have peace and comfort and security. We want but don't have. No one can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one or love the other. You cannot serve God and money. A second reason why we tend to make God lesser and money greater in our lives is what he goes on into the next verse, verse 25. You may have never connected these two before. Don't be fooled. Just because somebody put a title in there a number of years later, Jesus is teaching this in one lesson. Look, notice verse 25, therefore. I studied under a pastor once, and he says, whenever you see the word therefore, you should ask yourself, what's the therefore, therefore? I never forgot that. What's the therefore, therefore? So in verse 25, he says, you cannot serve God and money. Therefore, okay, in light of that truth, I tell you not to be anxious about your life. 
And he doesn't go on to talk about the great things, the achieving things, the nice cars, the big houses, the things we covet. No, he's going to talk about basic needs. About what you will eat or what you will drink about your body, what you put on it. No, back then, right? And we talked about uh, laying up um, your treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, right? You would have had coins that would have rusted. You would have had clothing that moth could have come in and destroy. Clothing was a sign of wealth back then because clothes were very expensive. Don't think of it today where we can get clothes fairly cheaply at thrift stores and other places. Some folks who were poor enough didn't have any clothes at all, wandered around naked back then. And so when he's saying your basic needs of a covering, of a shelter, of the food, of, of drink, he's talking about basic needs. He's saying, don't be anxious about these things. Life is more than that. And I imagine he's teaching outside in a field somewhere. And as he's teaching, he sees some birds fly past, and he points. He says, look at the birds in the sky. And they all look, right? They say, look, he, they don't toil. They don't work really hard. They don't store massive amounts of wealth away in savings accounts and places so that if something should happen, they don't do that. And yet, your Father in heaven feeds them. And notice what Jesus says then. Are you not more valuable than the birds? He's making a value statement. God loves his creation in the birds of the sky, and he takes care of them. He says, but you are made in the image of God. The implied answer, of course, it's a rhetorical question. The answer, of course, is yes. You have the image of God. God loves you and considers you immensely valuable. Will he not take care of you? Is what Jesus is saying. Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider, I imagine they're in a field, and he says, consider the lilies of the valley, the field. Look, the grass. It just grows, and then you cut it down, and you burn it for fuel and heat. And yet God cares enough to put the lilies and the flowers in there to make a beautiful-looking field. He says, will he not do the same for you? How much more valuable are you than the grasses? He said, don't even think Solomon. I mean, Solomon, one of the wealthiest men in history, Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of those fields. He answers two questions through our anxiousness, and I'm going to get there in a second. But notice what he says. But if God so clothes the grass field of the day that alive tomorrow, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Notice it's a question. And you might not like this, and it kind of rubbed me the wrong way when I read it, but hey, God needs to correct us, right? He says, don't you know that anxiousness about the future anxiousness about protecting what you have and will you have what you need in the future, that anxiousness is based in having little faith. When I talk to kids, some of the youth sometimes, I'll meet with them and I, I, try, I, I often say, do you believe in God? Do you have faith? And I try to define, it's not like, yeah, even the devil believes in God, but that's not the saving faith. We're talking about trusting him. Do you trust God? Do you have faith in him? To be anxious about the things of this world is to demonstrate you have little trust in God's care and ability to provide for you. And that's what he answers in his metaphor, doesn't he? Are you not more valuable than birds? He wants to correct the lie that you might believe that God doesn't care enough for you to provide for you. Jesus wants to say you are immensely valuable to him. He will provide for you. And how much more those in whom has been redeemed by his son. He says, he did not even spare his son, but gave him up on a cross that he might die, taking our punishment for sin, that we might be made righteous. If he didn't withhold his son, will he not give us everything else that we need? Of course he will. So not only are you valuable in his life, he has the power to do it. Solomon would have looked good. He was wealthy. He would have looked good in his clothes. But the power of God speaking creation into being and the flowers that show up in the field, the wildflowers, he says, that was easy for God. He can do it. He loves you enough to do it. Will you trust him to do it? Jesus gave a parable, parable of the sower. Do you know, some of you might know that parable in Scripture, parable of the sower. 
It was a story about a farmer who had taken seed and gone out and scattered it. The seed was the gospel message. And he wanted us to be faithful scatterers of the seed, telling folks about gospel. But he wanted us to warn us, you're going to see some of the different reactions when you share the gospel. Sometimes it's going, that seed's going to fall on hard soil. It's a hard heart. Devil's going to come and take it away. You're not going to see any response to it. He says, of course, on the other end, some will fall in good soil and will grow and produce fruit. That's genuine faith. 40, 60, 100 fold of fruit. Brilliant harvest. He says, but there's going to be two in the middle. They're going to look like they're genuine faith, but they won't be. And this is what will happen. Some are on shallow soil. The seed will fall in. It will sprout up really quick. We're excited. We're getting baptized. We're, we're celebrating the Lord's work in them. But persecution comes in their life. Their roots aren't deep. And because trials in the life come to test the genuineness of our faith, they don't uphold and they wither away. But there's that third one. You remember that third one? That seed that goes into the soil and it sprouts up, but it's in the thorns and the thicket, right? And it chokes the plant to where it dies. Do you remember what Jesus says that is that's choking out that plant? It's the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. And Jesus is talking about it once again right here. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. We fail to trust God for our provision, so we go chasing after some other God we think we can control. We chase after money. Money will be able to secure our future. Money will be able to protect what we have. Money will be able to get us the food and the clothes and the education that my kid needs. And as the people view it as, oh, God will be able to get me the things I've been desiring, that happiness, that contentment, that money will get me to achieve that. And we make decisions. We, we prioritize our life under that master. But I ask you, can money keep you from being sick? Can money keep you from some disaster happening? Notice that's what he's saying in verse 19. Do not lay up your treasures here on earth because moth and rust destroy. Thieves break in and steal. What happens if the stock market crashes? What happens if someone breaks into your house and takes what you want? You're going to store up your money on something that can't even protect itself? It's inanimate. It's an object. And can it, call, can it, can it help you in times of need? Can it call back a wayward child as you pray for them? When you die and pass on from this earth, is money going to greet you into an eternal life? It might buy you a nice headstone. But the God of the earth can bring you into eternal life. And if you live for life now in a way that stores up your rewards and treasures in heaven, guess what? It's going to be there forever. There is a bank account in heaven that never runs dry, that does not collapse. That bank account is one you want to be storing your wealth in because that is where the vast majority of your existence is going to be. And how do you do that? You serve God. You don't serve money. We did some uh, pre-marriage counseling as a pastor, right? And that's always funny because, you know, they're so excited to get married. <laughs> they have no idea what's in store. Marriage is a beautiful thing. It's hard work, but it's beautiful. And in some of this counseling, I remember we got, my wife and I, we got counsel right here in this own church, right? This was our church. Our family counseled us. And in one of those sessions, they brought in three couples. It was an older couple, a middle-aged couple with a bunch of kids, and a, and a young couple that just got married six months ago. And I don't remember much else of the session, but one of the questions was, what's one piece of advice you have for these couples? And the older couple, they're like, you just need to love each other. You know, they've been through a lot of things together. They've learned to just serve one another, not sweat the small stuff. They're like, you just need to love one another. In the middle couple, they got all the kids. They're both working. They're, they're, they're all these sort of wearing all these different hats. And they're like, you have to schedule everything. <laughs> and I mean everything. <laughs> right? And then I remember that younger couple. That younger couple, uh, what's one piece of advice you have? And he just blurts out, she doesn't even like peanut butter. Every stage has its things, right? You know what they say is one of the biggest conflicts in marriage? Money. They say one of the biggest conflicts in marriage is money. And so often, right, in counseling with couples who are married, and hey, if you're struggling with this, if you're struggling with your marriage, you get some counseling, invite a friend into it. We all need it. It's not embarrassing. It's worth fighting for. 
but couples who are struggling with money, oftentimes you have two people thinking about it totally different. You might have somebody viewing money as a way to achieve, to win in life, to move things forward. You might see someone who views money as more of a way to protect what they have. Of course, the beautiful way. And so they see, they're always talking past each other. They're always thinking differently. And you want to try to help that couple speak the same language. And then you want to help them think about money in a way that says, how can we use this to steward resources well to move God's kingdom forward? God doesn't need us. And he doesn't need our money. But he uses us. And he uses our money to move his kingdom forward. And if we, want to, if we want to be used by him, if we want to use the resources he's given us, he's going to reward us in heaven for that. Do not give in to serving money. You cannot serve money and God. The anxieties of this life, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, it will choke your relationship with God. Do not be of little faith. You can trust him who loves you who can do it and considers you most valuable. I told you to memorize that verse there in verse uh, uh, 20, 21 there. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do you see that? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's a beautiful verse. It goes both ways, right? You want to know where your heart is. We're so deceived sometimes. You want to know where your heart is? Look at your credit card statement. Just track for a month what you spend and where you spend it. Some of you love coffee. You are devoted to that Starbucks. Where you spend your money. Some of you love the gym. You like to look good, right? Some of you value organic food. You can check that out on your, on your uh, budget, I'm sure. Where you spend your money is an indication of your devotion So you want to know? Oh, I challenge you. Go, look, where do you spend your money? Where do you, where do you use your money? It'll tell you about your heart. But the beautiful thing is, is it works both ways, right? You want your heart to be attached to something. You want to love something more. You want to increase your trust and faith. Put your money where your mouth is. Put your money where that desire is. And you'll watch your joy grow. It is more blessed to give than receive, amen? What parent, right, has ever had the joy of going out and, and buying a gift and bringing it home for their child? And their child opens up. It could be a small thing. Sometimes I just go get a Chick-fil-A cookie for my son, and, I, and he thinks I am the best. <laughs> well, you give them that present, they open it up, it's something they love. Look at the joy that comes on their face. They are so excited. And what do you feel? You feel a love and attachment to that child because you've just taken money. You sacrificed money. You sacrificed money for someone else and somehow your heart begins to be tied to that. You want to love God more? You want your faith to increase? Change how you use your money. Move your money towards the things of God. See, I'm in Medina now. We just launched in May. And this church sacrificed money to send us out. And I talk to folks all the time. They've never been out there. But they say, I pray for you all the time. I have such a love for, I have such a love for what God's doing out there. Why do they say that? Because they've given sacrificially. The, the Lord has attached their hearts to that movement of planting churches in Northeast Ohio. You want to love God and love his mission? Give. And because we're launched independent, I'm no longer part of this church, I can say that without you accusing me of uh, certain motives. <laughs> right, your money doesn't get me a pay raise. <laughs> right, Jesus isn't interested in your money, but he is interested in your heart. You say, I'm not anxious about the future, but you give a whole lot, you give very little to the church, and you've got a massive saving account at home. It's not bad to save for the future. But when you're anxious about what's going to happen next in my future, there can be a disproportion. You might not have thought about that as being anxiousness. I'd invite you to pray and think about that. It's not bad to plan for the future and to steward well. 
But if you let that anxiety and that fear get to you of the future, it will rob you of your blessing. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. No one can serve two masters. He will hate the one or love the other. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I encourage you to be people of generosity. To use money as a tool, not your God, as a tool to be used to bless others. That when there's a need, when you hear of a need, maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's not even a believer, maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's a friend, do you take a step towards them to help meet that need? Do you give faithfully to Jesus through this church? Right? Do you put offerings in the plate? Does this church not serve you? Is not your folks gathering to preach the word that your soul, you might be edified? That the children, the next generation might know the Lord? Is it not this church that is investing in young folks like me when I was young in college? That I might know the Lord and have an impact for the kingdom? This church is given, and because it is given and sacrificed, the kingdom of God has spread. I meet people all over the place that are like, man, I had a professor in seminary. He came to the chapel. Are you part of that? Are you part of the kingdom growth that's coming out of this church? Are you giving? I'd encourage you to. Because you can have some nice things on earth for a few years. Or you can have some rewards in heaven for eternity. And you know what you find? When you trust the Lord for your provision, and you trust him, you will find that it's not just... It's the more meaningful things in life you begin to have. Happiness, peace, contentment. If you're not a believer and you have felt the world, I mean, the Gentiles chase after these things, right? The non-believers. If you've been running in, in this rat race of a world to try to achieve, to try to be something, to try to protect yourself, and you're feeling anxiousness, you're feeling the race, and everything you've chased after has not provided the things you're looking for, Happiness, peace, contentment. If you know death looms on the other side and you know all the wealth that you're stacking up and chasing after isn't going to get you anywhere on the other side, I would invite you today to stop serving money. Stop serving yourself and your own wants. Give yourself to something greater. You were made for it. God was never made to satisfy you. I mean, sorry, money was never made to satisfy you. God was made to satisfy you. Don't clip that into some short video. <laughs> God was made to satisfy you. We're going to take a moment here and just have a small, just moment of, of prayer. Just, just a moment of prayer, church. And if you have felt like you have begun to be anxious, begin to covet after things and begin to allow money to control your life, I would just invite you to repent of that and say, Lord, I want to serve you. You are my God. If you're not sure, ask God, search my heart. You know my way. Show me if there be any grievous way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. And if you're not a believer and you've been on the world's treadmill of a rat race, chasing after things that won't matter here in 60, 70 years, I'd invite you to take a step of faith today and say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I'm trusting you now. I want to live for you. And you do that, you will find your world to be changed. Just take a minute to pray. God, hear our prayers now as a church. Prompt us by your spirit. What should we say? Pray, help us to pray to you, God. Father God, your word says you are a jealous God and you won't let another take your place. Father, I pray in the decision points of our lives that as a church in the decision points when we can serve money or you in your righteousness, God, give us the strength of your spirit to choose you in that which is right over that which just gains us more wealth. For those who are anxious about life, who find themselves overwhelmed by the cares of this world, God, would you speak Right now, God, just a, a small voice in their heart. Or would you just speak to them of their value in your eyes? Would you speak to them of the power for which you have to care for them? Calm them, I pray. 
For those of us, God, who want things that aren't ours, forgive us. Would you help us to wait on you and in the meantime, just serve you in joy. And church, right now, would you pray for those who might be praying for the first time for salvation? And if that's you and you're praying, God, would you forgive me? And would you, would you help me make you my God? I just, I want to pray for you. That you would indeed know the joy and the power that comes through faith in Christ. We love you and thank you. Church, if you agree, in Jesus' name, amen. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.